The Twins are going to win the World Series. The Twins have won it. It's a base hit. It's a one nothing and an victory. Guys, let's start with just how the 1991 team was formed. There was a transformation from the 87 champs to 91 that to some degree became complete during that offseason when Gary Gaetti left and the addition of, of Jack and Chili Davis. What were your thoughts when you made a couple of those roster moves prior to the 91 season? Did you feel like you had the pieces in place immediately? Oh, I don't, I don't know if you ever know if you have all the pieces in place. Uh, you know, it's all on paper as, we, as you speak, but, you know, an opportunity arose to maybe acquire Jack. There was a lot going on there with that, and there's a number of phone calls I know I made to Jack and uh, trying to get him to see it our way for a year or two, and fortunately that worked out. But, you know, to be honest, I, I, I really don't remember too much about Chile, what the uh, deal was, or Mr. Uh, McPhail and what he was doing to try to get Chile, but I know I, I had to get involved with Jack uh, a little bit and uh, try to sweet talk him a, a a touch. As, as far as players, though, strengthening up a ball club, you get a guy like Jack to come into your ball club, and we were fired up about it. Again, Chile was another one, like Tom says, you know what, how things went, but to get Chile on the ball club, no other guy could hit from both sides of the plate, DH for us. The thing with Chile, I remember we were in the training room, it was in spring training, and Chile was doing this one machine, and he had a towel, and he put it, and he put it here and he leaned forward with his head and he just started and I I was going oh my goodness look at this animal and and I, I walked away and came back in 20 minutes and he still was there and I was going my goodness gracious this at least I know he wants to work and and uh, he's serious about his job and and uh, obviously when a, I think a player comes over uh, Danny uh, Jack came over uh, Chili. I think they, they try to make an, a good impression, and, and usually people that work hard, they always seem to fit right in. If you work hard, you, you fit in, and, and Chili certainly, he impressed me that just from that one half hour, I was just sort of watching him. Danny probably, Danny, he played with Chili. I played with Chili in San Francisco. We came up together, and when I got to the big leagues, he ended up going from center field to right field, so that's something I've always kind of told me. I pushed you out of a position, and eventually he got to be a DH, but the addition when he came over, he's always been a guy that works hard. Uh, so that wasn't surprising, but what I liked is we had a guy that could DH from both sides of the plate. It lengthens the lineup a little bit, and you've got a guy there that can protect some of the other hitters in Herbeck uh, and Puckett, guys like that in the middle of the order. So when I heard from Andy McPhail about Chili Davis, I said, you have to get, get him. He's a great guy in the clubhouse, uh, a good worker, and he compliments the other players around him. I don't know why you spent so much time uh, worrying about Jack because you only got him for one year and then he jumped ship and went somewhere else. That was his business. The, the one year was important in the history. Yes, of I understand. You can see the love here. You know, from my perspective, being the guy coming to this team, you know, there was obvious reasons. Part of it was the way I felt I was being treated in Detroit. But the majority of why I did it is because I realized the guys that I was having my way with for several years, I was no longer having my way with anymore. And uh, when I knew that this guy and this guy were difference makers and that, I mean, on my best day, I couldn't, I couldn't do what I once did against them. So better join them than, than try to beat them anymore. And, you know, so I had a chance. Yeah, but and you it was to come back home, too. Yeah, it was home. And coming home was a no-brainer for me. And I, I, more than anybody else, might have believed in this team long before it ever came to fruition. But I, I really did. And when Chili and I met for the first time and we were kind of the, the new guys coming in, we had a game plan that we were both trying to do. I was going to work my magic with the pitchers, and he was going to do whatever he could. But it was more lead by example than anything else. Just be who we were. And it just, you know, it was a magical year. It worked out for all of us. The other of you guys were a part of the 87 championship too. Did you sense something similar early that in that 91 season or tr even in spring training where you felt like, okay, we've gone from world champs 
to last place in 1990, but it felt like there was life injected into the club with a couple of those moves. Did you guys sense something even in spring training that there were great things possible for this club? I don't recall the 90 season in that we were in last place because I'm sure going into 90, the 90 season, there were some new faces that came into camp. Hey, when the season starts, you think you got a chance. But if this season goes along, uh, I'm sure it was a terrible season, but I don't recall it being as bad as last place. Right. And then, of course, uh, just, you know, getting Jack and, and Chili. There were some other guys there and, you know, Chuck Knobloch and, and the fact that Chuck went, came from double A to the big leagues. And, you know, I heard that you fought a lot to get Chuck Knobloch on that team. A lot of people don't know that you said, this is my second baseman. And he was the rookie of the year. So not only you get Jack, you get Chili. Uh, you get the rookie of the year on your team, and then you've got other veteran players and the combo of, of Pags and Leas at third base. And of course, you had Gagne, who was on that team, steady, and then of course, in the outfield. So, uh, Shane Mack. Shane Mack. Uh, so, you, know, you talk about the 87 team, we had Viola and Blylev, and then it, it dropped down just a little bit or a lot. Les Straker, I think, was our number three starter after that. And number mm -hmm. four, uh, you were pulling well, something out of the hat, Dad. Yeah, we had a, a number of choices. Let's not go into that. But, it, but the 91, <laughs> you, you had more depth in the starting rotation. Yeah, well, Jack, we had yeah, Taft. Taft. Taft Eric, and, Scotty uh, Erickson had a heck of a Scotty year. was we good. Had, Scotty had, three, had that little bit of the elbow. Three starters who were American League Pitcher of the Month. Correct. And that's, three, that's half the year right there that you had the best starter in the league. So that made a difference. Well, they had to do everything possible to make me smarter. So that's... <laughs> That's one of their players pieces. always do, don't they? They can make you look not too smart yeah. either. So the you guys get off to a little bit of a slow start, two and nine out of the gates, and I think it was twenty and twenty-four at the beginning of the season, sitting near the bottom of the division. Was there no doubt in your minds though at that point? I mean, there wasn't like a boy. It doesn't feel. It feels like we're missing something. Or was there? Did you have a confidence even through that slow start? I, I just want to call of hand, raise of hands of how many got called in on the carpet that after the second week. And you had to go up and see Mr. McPhail, I believe. Probably. I did. I mean, I tried to explain to Andy. I, we went from Fort Myers to the West Coast. Then we came back and played three games, then went back to the West Coast. Then I think we came back home and played a, a few games. Then we went to East Coast. And things didn't work out so well. And you remember more than I do as yeah. far as the start well, of the it, season. Yeah, I've gotten grilled about this, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, I never forget it. Getting, I said, Andy, I said we've been changed time zones like five, six times in, in a matter of three weeks. I mean, I think we're okay, just, but he was hot. But uh, we got off to a bad start, or not the best start that you're looking for, but. Um, it's a long way. It's a long road to haul, and, and uh, I never even worried about that stuff at the time. I don't think a player, I, I that, never, you know, as, as far as a player or, or, when you, or even a coach, and you think uh, you're not out of it until they tell you you're out of it. You got to keep playing. There's no clock here either. You know. I you're knew we were a lot better. I, I just flat out knew we were way better. I, I was pressing. I'm sure Chile was probably early. You know, you're a new guy on a team that you believe in, and you want to make a good impression and. And you wake up one morning and realize you can't do everything. You got to stay within yourself. All the things, the cliches you hear in baseball. But I knew we were way better than what you, the way we started. And when we started winning, it was almost like a relief. It was like, okay, this is us. This is the team that we can be and will be. It was 20 and 24, and you're fifth place in the division, and then ripped off 15 wins in a row. And I remember as a fan that win streak. It just felt like every night, somehow, some way, you guys were going to win a game. Is that? Was that the feeling that the ball club had? It, it, there were nights where you blew people out. There were nights where you rallied late. There were nights with great pitching, nights with a lot of offense. It, it felt like no matter what, somehow you guys were going to win a game. All I know is I was pretty superstitious about it. <laughs> and I remember we're in Baltimore, and we, when I screwed up, and I will admit that I screwed it up, but I, it must have been 98 degrees in there in, in that dugout, and I was wearing that heavy jacket that I started off the the streak with, so I wasn't going to take it off. I was sort of, I wasn't happy we lost, but I was happy to get the jacket off. <laughs> but uh, Aggie was pitching, and, and I, I walked Cal Ripken intentionally. Randy Milligan was the next hitter, and, and uh, Aggie threw him two splitters. 
that he missed by, like I would miss them. I mean, he missed them. And then he hung one and he hit it off the wall. I said to myself after that, I would not have my closer intentionally walk a guy ever again. The players trust the guy. The fans trust him. Everybody trusts him. And then I went and said, basically, maybe you can't get this guy out. And, and uh, so we're going to pitch to the next guy. And I, I said to myself, I would never do it again. So that's your worst, never did. your worst managing move ever? One of them. <laughs> <laughs> we put you guys in first place. And from that point to the finish, you never gave it up. So it was a little bit different than what you guys had down the stretch in 87, where it was a grind to make sure you won the division. This time, you had a comfortable lead down the stretch. Was it a different feel for you guys down the, the last couple of weeks of the season, knowing that the playoffs were ahead instead of hoping to fight your way into the playoffs? I looked at it two ways. You could clinch it too early and then get too much time off and maybe not have that mojo going into the playoffs, or you play good till the end and then keep that mojo going. In 87, I thought we had a heck of a lot better club in 91 than we did in 87. 87, we were on a high, winning, and a bunch of kids, and not really knowing what's going on, and just playing the game. In 91, I thought we had a heck of a lot better team, and that we should win. Probably would have been a lot more upset if we would have lost both Game 7s, which we're lucky enough to won both Game 7s. I would have been more depressed in 91 by losing than, than 87. I thought we had a heck of a lot better team in 91 than we did in 87, as far as you know, solid ball club, better ball club.